debugging has been the bane of programmers' lives for a long, 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 long time. Um, and the reason why I decided to do this talk was very simple. I interview an awful lot of people. I've lost absolute count of how many people I've interviewed. And I've had quite a, a few candidates in front of me who had fantastic technical skills, um, had great experience, but when you pose them a debugging problem, they jumped to the trouble spots they were familiar with, and then they would stumble very badly. They were lacking in any kind of a, a thought out or a disciplined approach. And in day-to-day -day work, that's fine. Most of the time when you're working on the project, you know, you know where the trouble spots are and it's where you look for trouble first. And most of the time that'll be the quick solution and it'll be the right path to go. It's what do you do when that fails? What do you do when you're stumped and you don't know what, how the hell this is happening? So I'm going to be trying to run you guys through um, some of my processes, some of my tools, some of my techniques. I'm going to be moving pretty quickly. Um, because immediately after we're done here, the room has to be reconfigured for the lightning talk. So I'm going to try and get through a lot of material pretty fast. So I'm going to ask you to hold questions until the end. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time. If we don't, you'll be able to find me over at the rapid rating stand uh, today and tomorrow. And I'd love to sit down and talk with any of you. So very quickly, we're going to go through some browser tools, the Django debug toolbar, uh, an interesting debugger, logging metrics, load testing, profiling, and some recommended re reading, all very much with a, a Django rather than a generic focus. Ah, uh, oh, damn it. <laughs> um, I'm just going to call this out. I forgot to update the slide. If you look on GitHub for Sean O'Donnell, my name, no spaces, there's a lot of code examples up there. Typically, what you've got is you have a... Um, a stock project from Django, run with Django admin start project, and then the bare minimum of code to get the tool to work and some example code and views. You'll see some of that example code and views as we're going through. If you want, you can check this out. Every last one of them has a requirements.txt file so you can get all the libraries. It just means if you try and use one of these tools and you're struggling, you can consult one of these as a reference project and you'll probably find the setting or the tweak that you're missing. Um, so the general advice, everyone knows this. The most powerful troubleshooting tool in the world is a search engine. Um, learn to use it well, however. A lot of people don't know how to. They haven't gone to the Google Advanced page and found out the options. They haven't looked at other search engines. If you're trying to debug specific error messages, it is really worth your while to try DuckDuckGo. It is really worth your while to learn their operators. DuckDuckGo is a little bit like old Google before they decided it knew better than you did. So if you're trying to find something obscure, give that a shot. And the last quick one for anyone really new, if you search for a problem and you see a stack overflow link in the search results, that's probably the first one you should jump to because it's usually where you're going to find the best answer. Uh, give me one second here. I have a feeling I've opened an old version of this slide deck. Yep, there we go. That's where you'll find all of the code samples. I'm going to leave that up for just one second in case anyone wants to scribble it down or take a snapshot of it. So you'll see every directory there is a sample project. It's got everything you need in to run one of these tools and try it. It has a readme with full instructions on how to do it. They all work. That should help you out. So, uh, yeah, there we go. All right, so the first thing is technique. The very, very, very first thing is try and get to the point where you can replicate your problem. This is just general debugging advice. It's got nothing to specific to Django. Once you can make the problem happen at will, that is going to save you an awful lot of time. If you get a report of a bug and you go, oh, I think it's that, and you fix it and you throw it back out, and then you wait to hear if it's happening again, you'll probably hear of it happening again. Try and get a unit test, try and get a test suite, try and get a series of steps. Try and get something that will make this happen at will. It's not always possible but it should be your first step. Can I make this always happen? What do I do to do that? Once you've got that down, the next principle is divide and conquer. You want to take your system, divide it into logical chunks, and rule them out or in one at a time. If you know for a fact it's not the database, you've removed a huge amount of problems. If you know for a fact your problem isn't in the browser, you've rem removed a huge amount of the problem space. When you really don't know what's going on, 
your first job is divide and conquer. Narrow it down. You mightn't be able to narrow it all the way down with simple tests, but you can usually narrow it a lot of the way down. In a few slides time, I'm gonna walk through a very trivial example of what I mean by that. But divide and conquer is, is absolutely the rule. Once you've narrowed it down and you still can't figure what's going on, test your assumptions. I often have people coming to me day to day and work and kind of going, I've been trying to figure this out for two, three hours and I just can't get it to happen or I can't figure out why this hasn't fixed it. And it turns out, well, you're on the wrong server or you're, you know, the version of software on the server is not the version that you're reading on your local machine to try and solve the problem. Or every time you're trying to fix it, you're deploying to the wrong machine and then you're checking for the fix on another machine. So test everything you think you know. Um, this is, these are stories where if you've done it long enough, everybody has hit one of these days. Everyone's hit the day where they've gone, I'm such a bloody idiot, I can't believe I just spent four hours debugging the wrong server. But a lot of the time, if you have a problem that seems to defy all logic and all belief, it's time to step back and test your assumptions. And that can be really hard to do, because it's not always obvious to you what your assumptions are. At the point you've been working on something for four hours, you're pretty sure you're on the right server. So you really need to take a big step back and figure out what do I believe to be true that's actually false? Because a lot of the time, that's what's biting you. The other thing that can be very useful when you're stuck in a debugging problem is to rephrase the problem. Most of the time when you're looking at a bug, you're saying to yourself, why the hell doesn't this work? This should work, why doesn't it work? The, the almost universally applicable um, flip you can do to think about it differently is ask yourself, why is it doing what it's doing? If you can understand the current behavior, then you'll probably find the bug along the way. And a very simple trick like that on how you're looking at the problem can suddenly cause you to step back and maybe catch one of those assumptions. Why is it doing what it's doing? Because it's on another server, something like that. So these are the four principles, which with enough practice and enough thought will conquer almost everything. Now I'm gonna go um, tour through some of the tools I use to put these into action day to day. Uh, and one tool that I found only very recently at the end, which I haven't had too much experience with yet, but it's so much fun I have to show you. Um, so I talked about divide and conquer. If you're doing web development, I'm gonna specifically talk about it here. Generally speaking, your problem is gonna lie in one of these four areas. It's gonna be in the client, it's gonna be in the browser, it's gonna be a network problem, it's going to be a problem on the server, which typically means it's a, a Django application problem, or it's going to be a problem at the DB. Your performance problem or your bug is almost always going to live into one of these four areas. So if you don't really know what's going on and you've exhausted your quick guesses, job one is narrow this the hell down. So a lot of people don't know. Uh, if you fire up a browser like Chrome and you press F12, you get a really nice array of developer tools. And in particular, if you're profiling and trying to find out why a web page is slow, the first thing you should do is go to the network tab. Hopefully that's not too small for you to see, but it's the fourth tab in from the left, and this is Chrome specifically. Uh, Firefox and Safari all have very similar tools built into them. Uh, I like Chrome's best. I recommend you have a copy of Chrome running, even if only to get to this view. And what you're seeing at the bottom of the screen there, the little green bars, is how long is everything taking to load? This is the actual PyCon web page. So you can, it's very, very, very easy to glance and see that the initial fetch of the page was 703 milliseconds, and then everything else, loading JavaScript, uh, parsing CSS, is over in a heartbeat. If you've got a piece of JavaScript that's gone rogue and is eating four or five seconds of page load time, you glance at this, you're gonna know that's what it is. If you're wondering, is it something happening in the browser or is it a slow network connection? You glance at this, you're gonna know what it is. So if you flip back to our, uh, our previous example, just looking at that one page, an awful lot of the time is gonna either rule out the client, rule out the network, or rule out both. So if you've got a strange problem that only seems to be showing up in the browser, that's your first stop. You gotta look there. Um, it's that easy. Uh, so this is, a similar, um, this is a similar illustration. This one's from Firebug, and it actually produces a nice flame graph. If you're not familiar with a flame graph, the wider the bar is on this flame graph, the more time the browser is spending doing it. The narrower the bar is, so towards the bottom of the diagram, 
the less time it's spending. So you'll see the, the big items like where it's uh, parsing HTML and you'll get a very narrow breakdown. This is actually slightly better than Chrome's tool if you really need to dig down. And yet again, you've got a nice visualization at the bottom in the form of a pie chart on exactly where it's spending its time. So if you then go, well, it's not my client, it's not the network, and you go to visit your application server and you see something like this, happy days. Uh, if you're actually getting an exception, if your bug is, is that big that something explodes, you're probably not that badly off. Um, this is debug mode in Django. Uh, a quick word of advice, don't leave debug mode turned on in any long running server. It doesn't matter if it's your UAT server and it doesn't matter if it's your test server, debug mode keeps a history of all of the database queries that you're running. Debug mode used to leak stuff like passwords quite readily. It's gotten quite a bit better at sanitizing that by default. But even if it's not, if you're deploying into an environment where it's going to run for a few days, you're basically running the me pre-memory leaked version of your software. It will eventually break down and then you'll end up getting bug reports that aren't really bug reports. So turn debug mode on when you know you have a problem and you need it. Don't turn it, leave it running the whole time. And the next thing I will say here is just because you're getting the exception doesn't necessarily mean the bug is easy to fix. Sometimes people look at the code and go, that looks right. It looks just like the example from the doc page of the library I'm using, or it looks just like the example in the Django docs, and it's still crashing. What the hell is going on? And the one thing I will say about this is, this is somewhere where I, as a matter of habit, uh, take the opportunity to read the actual Django framework source code. And if you want to get good at fixing problems in Django over time, a really useful thing to do, have is a very good knowledge of the Django internals. And you'll find in the stack trace, you can see the exact location of the file and the modules in the virtual env. I will often just copy paste that into an editor and bring up the module. Often I'll discover that there's a flag that's slightly deceptively, descri uh, deceptively described in the Django docs, or there's an extra feature, or they've slightly changed how this works and assumptions from one version of Go and Django aren't really true, some undocumented behavior I was relying on isn't true anymore. Um, you'll also learn a lot of really useful patterns in Python development. Django is pretty well written and it's actually pretty easy to read. So if you get stumped, if the code isn't doing what you expect it to do and the docs seem to say you're right, take 10-15 minutes out, read the Django source code. Over the course of years, having dipped into so many parts of it, you're going to have a fairly decent command of exactly how the Django internals work. And the more context and knowledge you have, the easier it's going to be to uh, reason about problems. So next is the Django debug toolbar. Um, hands, quick show of hands, how many people know the Django debug toolbar have used it? It's about half. This thing is a lifesaver. If, if you don't know it, um, you're going to love it. Uh, it's pretty easy to install. It's on PyPy, and yet again, there's an example project with everything set up for you. So this is a little trivial web app you're looking at right now. I took the first 10 or so entries off today's schedule, slapped them in along with the speaker. And over on the right-hand side, that little panel is the Django debug toolbar. It's popped up automatically because it's installed and the app is currently in debug mode. And you have a whole bunch of useful information you can get to if you start clicking through there. So first of all, if I hit time, you can see exactly how much CPU time it's used. You can even see a very primitive version of the browser's breakdown of time. And there are some optional extras you can install on this that will give you even more of that data. But frankly, none of them are as good as the browser's built-in tools at this stage. Next one is headers. All of the HTTP headers, both request and response. This can help you with some very obscure problems. Um, if any of you, for example, this helped me only about three or four months ago. If any of you are working with AWS and you're working with elastic load balancers, elastic load balancers require a health URL. They hit your application server repeatedly to find out if the server is up, and if they don't get a response, they take the server out. One of our, apps, one of our applications, ELB just wouldn't see it. It turns out ELBs are very, very, very particular about what they consider to be a valid um, HTTP response. And the most recent versions of Django, when you run uh, Star Project, don't include what used to be a standard piece of middleware, the conditional get middleware, which is responsible for adding a content length header to the response. ELBs, no content length header, don't consider it valid, even if it's a 200 response and it'll be invisible to them. 
So sometimes if you're working with, um, it's very hard to find that documented for an ELB because it, it's not. There's no uh, official piece of documentation that will tell you that. That's another great case of Google the hell out of it, find a symptom, check for the symptom. But there are a lot of appliances and tools out there that are very particular about specific headers, specific encodings, that kind of thing. So this tab is very useful. So this is a very, very, very trivial little page. It's, it's fetching a small amount of data from a DB. And there's one thing that the Django debug toolbar is sort of screaming out loud to me if you're used to using it, um, which is that, look at the SQL header. 11 queries for that much data. And if you quick click on the SQL button, and this for me, this is an almost daily tool. If I'm looking at a, a view in Django or a view in Django REST framework, and I want to know what's the DB doing, why is this slow, why am I getting this response time, this one tab makes Django Debug Toolbar worth its weight in gold. So what you're getting here is a breakdown of every query the page has run, exactly how long it took, um, and if you look, there's even two small buttons there, select and explain. Select will show you the raw data that came back. Explain will run your database's explain command. If you're not familiar with um, the explain command and you do a lot of work with databases, read up on it and learn how to interpret it. Um, it is the tool for figuring out why your query is slow. But to get very Django specific again for a moment, this is the view that you're seeing being rendered there. There's not an awful lot to it. It fetches the talks and it renders the talks. Uh, but if we look at the template, we can kind of figure out what's going on. And this is a very common mistake for beginning Django programmers. It's saying for every talk in the talks, show me the talk's title and then show me the talk speaker's name. What happens when this gets to, the, uh, to that for loop is the query has been executed. It starts iterating over it. And then every time it gets to a row in the result, it goes, oh, I need the speaker name. And it's running one more query. So instead of one query, we're getting 11 queries. This is the fix, the dot select related. It just says prefetch the relations on the object I'm querying for. There's a whole lot of options you can give to tune and optimize. There's a similar, um, there's a similar add on called prefetch related that works for many to many queries, although it's a bit less efficient. If you're having, if you're just beginning to profile a, a Django app that you've already written and you're finding you're running crazy amounts of SQL queries, these two commands are your first stop on the way. Obviously, the SQL tab in the Django debug toolbar is useful for an awful lot more than this, but this is a nice sort of a trivial example that illustrates how it can make a difficult to analyze problem very easy, very quickly. And once we put in select related, we're back to one query and everything is happy in the world. So you can see as well, we hit that little explain button and we'll get a breakdown. For a simple query like this, it's not that useful, but if you've got multiple joins, multiple indexes, this will be the thing that will say, hey, look, you never bothered to index that column. Um, takes a bit of reading to get used to explain, but if you're troubleshooting a lot, worth the time investment. Uh, next tab down, log messages. If you've hooked up logging in your app, you can view the log messages straight through your browser. You don't need to go hop onto the, onto the box and view through a log file. Handy. And um, there's some optional uh, plugins as well. There's a nice API for Debug Toolbar. If you want to write your own panel for Toolbar, not that hard to do. There are optional add-ins for things like Redis, for things like MongoDB. Um, there are bucket loads of them out there. If you're running a particular piece of infrastructure, you're using it in your Django views and you'd like to get it in here, there's a very good chance there's a tool for you out there already. There's a built-in um, profiling panel, it's not turned on by default, you have to add it in your settings file, and it's not very good. So I've decided to show you two of the uh, add-ons you can get. These You install these and you configure them separately. The first is the flame graph. And this is very similar to the flame graph you, uh, you saw earlier in the browser, although they've chosen to point it the other way up. Yet again, the wider a bar is, the more time the view is spending doing that. The narrower it is, it's a small little inline function, it isn't taking up much time. This isn't a great view to profile. I'm going to show you some better examples of profiling later, so don't worry too much about this specific thing. But if you've got a complicated view that's doing a lot, this can be an easy way to quickly visualize where it's spending the most time. The second one, which is useful, is the debug toolbar line profiler, which can be easier to read if your functions are short. Um, you have to, just as a side note, 
you have to use run server with some very particular switches to get this to run. If it runs in a multi-threaded mode, it's not going to work properly. Uh, there's, yet again, there's a readme and everything else and the example that I've got bundled up on those GitHub slides. So if that's something you want to look into, you won't be too badly caught out. But you can see here for every single line in the view, it's telling you how many times that line executed, what the average time was on that and so on. If you've got something slow, it's going to make it pretty obvious. These tools are nice and they're nice when you're getting a feel in development for how your code is performing but they're not much use in production. Um, if you have a problem whereby a view is slow one every hundred or one every thousand or one every two, 10,000 times it runs or randomly or intermittently and you're not sure what's going on, these aren't going to help you all that much. So I'm going to look at some more powerful uh, profiling tools in a little while. Um, so while the flame graph and the profiling plugin for Django Debug Toolbar are nice and they let you see how your code is performing as you build it, for the real thorny problems later on, you're going to need to break out separate tooling. These are, these are far from the be-all, end-all of profiling tools. Um, last one is, if you have built yourself a nice REST API or something that returns raw CSV or something else, debug toolbar is not going to work um, because it requires HTML in order for it to render its panels. So if there's no body tag there, it's going to flip out. Um, I don't know about you guys, I spend a lot of time in REST APIs, so being missing debug toolbar is a pain in the posterior. Um, I found this little recipe. No one has ever bundled it up with anything, uh, but it's out there. It's a nice little piece of middleware. It's probably out of date for Django 1.10, but it wouldn't be too hard to fix it up, where you toss it a query string argument of debug equals true, and it will wrap your JSON or whatever the hell it is your view is returning uh, in a minimal amount of HTML so that the debug toolbar can then kick in and off you go. So it's out there. This is literally lifted straight out of a, um, a Stack Overflow recipe. As I said earlier, all of these slides uh, are up on that GitHub account so you can grab this URL later and use it. Um, so don't think just because you're not working with HTML, you can't use debug toolbar. You still can. It just takes a little bit of extra code. Uh, debuggers. As you can see uh, from my choice of quotes, uh, I'm not actually the world's greatest fan of debuggers. Um, they are a useful tool. I absolutely don't look down at them. Um, but they tend to only be useful for relatively straightforward bugs. The, the random 1 in 10,000 bug, you're not going to have the time to step through your code 10,000 times in a row while randomly changing things and see what happens. When you get to really, really difficult problems, the debugger tends not to be a huge amount of help. Um, so I'm not saying don't know how to use a debugger. I'm not even saying don't use a debugger. But if it's the only tool in your toolbox, there will come a point in the troubleshooting process on really big problems where you'll just be stumped because it's no longer the right tool for the job. Um, that being said, here's a lovely debugger. Um, when I originally pitched this talk, I mentioned the works of uh, debugger in the profile. I've taken that out and put this in instead because it's been released since and it's really, really, really nice. Um, yet again, you just pretty much stick it in your installed apps and a few settings in your Django project. Uh, and then in your view, if you want to actually definitely stop and debug, you can see the two lines at the top of the view, import web PDB, web PDB .set trace, And then when you hit it in your browser, you'll see a lovely blank page if in this case, uh, because it won't have rendered anything. And you'll think, damn it, this thing has locked my uh, browser and it's not working and it's terrible. No, you just need to go to port 5555 on the box. And you will get this absolutely lovely little UI. Up on the top right, you've got all your local variables at the current line. In the middle, all the globals. On the left, the code you're currently stepping through. You've got some nice GUI controls to hop over a line, hop in, hop out. And the little text box at the very bottom of the screen with PDB and send, if you know PDB well, you can put absolutely any command you like in there and off you go. So you've got a full debugger in your browser straight away. And so this will work on a remote box. Don't put it on your production remote boxes, but it will work on a remote box. Uh, and yet again, you can flip this on and off in your settings file very easily. So if you do want a nice flexible debugger that's easy to turn on and off in your application, give it a try. I like it. Uh, you can also uh, hook it up so that it'll only trigger on an exception. So you see here, webpdb.catchpostmortem. Uh, anything inside that context decorator, if it raises an exception, webpdb will fire up, the browser will freeze, and you can go off to port 5555 to see what's going on. So it's a nice, flexible, handy tool for Django. 
Uh, so it's same, you can just see this is a simple example of the same code. When the whoops exception raises, triggers WebPDB, and off we go. Logging. Um, logging is something that always feels sort of unnecessary on a small app and a low traffic app until you suddenly have a lot of users and a lot of traffic and you're trying to figure out what is going on. Um, supposing you have uh, an error that occurs one in 10,000 times, and then over the course of six months you attract a million users, that's 100 times a day. Uh, if you then go to 10 million users, it's 1,000 times a day, and if you've set up the default Django configuration to mail you on an exception, you've just pretty much lost the use of your email account every morning. Um, at that point, you need to stop and you start, need to start logging. And there's a couple of things you, could lo you should log. Uh, I'm not going to go through too many examples here. I'm just going to give a little bit of general advice. First of all, if you've got something that's an exception handler, log the exception. Very simple. It's very, very easy to search a log file, find the exception, find the stack trace, and track down what's happened. If someone calls you up and they say, hey, around lunchtime I tried to do this and it looked like it crashed, it's nice to be able to jump into the log file, scroll back to around lunchtime, find the exception, find the stack trace, and know what actually happened rather than the strange and vague descriptions that your end users tend to give you. Um, it's probably also useful to log very important events. If you send an email, if someone fails to log in, you can then use that later to analyze the patterns and see, is there stuff that typically happens in the 10, 20 minutes before a particular error happens? It'll let you spot when the normal patterns of your application change and something odd is going on. If you have a lot of servers or a lot of traffic or anything else, look into log aggregation good and early. There's a lot of tools for this. Um, Gray log, Splunk, log slash, log entries. There's a whole industry around helping you manage and search your log files. Uh, for Django specific exceptions, it's also worth taking a look at Sentry. Sentry will sort of categorize errors and say, you've gotten 100 of this type of exception. And I've grouped them all together neatly and you can mark the solve and you've figured out the root cause and it's quite smart about it. And the last one is, uh, these days microservices are fairly popular where you have a server calling a server calling a server before the response is actually generated and flows back up the chain. Uh, Django Correlation ID is a nice little piece of middleware that lets you attach a unique ID to a request at the edge service that first um, talks uh, to your client, and that ID will then be passed all the way down the line. So that when you get a bug report, if you can figure out which user it was, you can find the correlation ID, and then you can see all the logs from all the services that were involved in putting that response together in the one place and time, which is obviously going to make your life an awful lot easier than hitting each service one at a time and trying to figure out, is that the request that got passed on from this? Because after a certain level of traffic, time alone isn't going to help you solve that problem. Very similarly, metrics. Um, we use a mix of Prometheus and hosted Graphite to generate metrics. Uh, when I say metrics, what I mean is uh, Live numbers on things like average response time from our services, uh, hits per second, mail sent, that kind of thing. These aren't so particularly useful in actually debugging a, a problem. They will let you see that a problem is coming. If your average response time on a server is going up and up and up and up and up and up over time, you'll probably get more time to solve the problem because you'll have seen it coming. You might also help you troubleshooting in that you might notice that there's a a big spike in traffic at 2 a.m. every morning and 2 or 5 a.m. every morning, that's when you get an exception generated. So if you can figure out what's causing the spike, you can probably figure out what's overloading your server and you can figure out the root cause of the problem. Um, it's useful to stick these up on a big screen where everyone can see them. Because if you've got a nice graph that tends to do this all day long, and suddenly does that, you're going to have a fairly good idea that something is wrong, you need to look into it. And with a bit of luck, you'll fix the problem before it's a problem for anyone else. Load testing. So, as I've said, um, load testing is uh, basically what does my application do under load? One of the, the fun things I had when writing this talk was I used some of the little toy uh, Django run server apps and I fired my little test load script at it. It's really easy to take down a run server with a load testing script. Um, so the problem is that if you have an application that does need to operate under load and you change it, you need to know that it is going to still work under load. You need to know, is it going to work under the load we expect in six months' time? Or if you have a problem that doesn't happen on your machine but happens in production, 
maybe you want to hit that particular endpoint under fake load so you can see does it break down at a certain point. Um, I've gone through quite a few tools for this over the years and I've sort of settled for the moment on Locust. You can get it at locust.io. It's really easy. It's like writing unit tests. This is about as simple uh, a Locust load test as you can possibly get. Um, essentially, it's just getting the forward slash URL. You can see the, the task with the get home page. You can put as many steps into the task you can want. You can order them. You can weight them. Um, you can set up farms of locust machines with one master locust machine and a swarm of uh, dependent machines that it will then use to generate enough traffic to bring, your, uh, to bring your network to its knees. So no matter how big the load you need to generate, an AWS account in Locust is going to generate enough traffic for you. Um, I've used stuff in the past uh, whereby it had some sort of an XML scripting language and while it could generate a lot of load, it was really painful to model more complex user behavior. This is just like unit tests. It has a setup, it has a teardown. It has, if you can think about it, you can get lo uh, Locust to load test it. And if you're used to writing Python unit tests, you're going to have a really easy time with it. Um, the way Locust basically works is you point it at the file with your Locust test, you point it at the host you want to test, and it will fire up a little web UI for you. The web UI looks like this. It's very simple. This is also useful because if, like me, sometimes you're working on a crappy Wi-Fi connection, I do not want to run the load test off my crappy Wi-Fi connection. I do not want my laptop to generate the load because I'm not trying to test the crappy Wi-Fi connection. I'm trying to test the app server I'm testing. So a lot of the time, I'll actually start Locust on another machine in AWS because I'm not trying to test the network. I'm trying to test my specific app. And this having its own built-in web-based UI means I can do that really trivially. I just SSH onto the machine. I fire up Locust. I connect my web browser. And off we go. It's very, very handy. So when you start Locust, uh, you give it a number of users to simulate and a hatch rate. So that basically means it's going to hatch five users a second until it hits 100 continuous users. And then it will just keep going. If your particular test script doesn't specify a specific number of uh, steps to take in an end, it'll run forever. Otherwise, uh, it'll stop when you've told it to stop. This is what you see when you run it. For every URL your script is hitting, you're going to see the number of requests so far, median, average, min, max response time, content size, number of requests per second, and that's, that's live. As you're looking at it, you will see those numbers update. Um, it's very good at running the tests. Locust does not come with a huge big suite of analytics to make sense of the numbers. What it does do is you can just download CSV files of all the raw data it's getting back. So, if you're somebody who really, really, really needs to crunch the numbers and do advanced analysis of what's coming back, Locus is not the tool that's going to do the analysis for you, but it'll generate the data so you can. And that's Locus. It's, it's very simple. It's very happy. Um, and that brings us on to profilers. Um, why a profiler? Some code is just too complicated to figure out where the slow part is by reading it, by stepping through it with a debugger, by putting in print statements, the skill breaks down on code of sufficient complexity. And there's two main types of profiler, if you're not familiar with profilers. There's instrumenting profilers. They work in various different ways, but the most common is they actually reach into your Python VM and they effectively uh, instrument the entry and exit points from every function and method. And then they time what's happening when you go in, they time what's happening when you go out. If you have an isolated server where you know what it, exactly what it is you want to profile, this works great. It sucks in production environments. Instrumenting profilers generate mountains of data, absolute mountains of data. It's not very practical to hook one up to a production server. Instrumenting profiles are also quite invasive. They have overhead on every entry and every exit. So sometimes the results you can get back from an instrumenting profiler can actually be deceptive because if you have a very, very, very fast method it could be the case that the instrumentation takes longer to execute than the very fast method, and it might wind up looking an awful lot slower than it is. Now, this, this makes it sound like they're useless. They're not. They're very valuable. The average use case, the numbers are good, uh, and they're probably generally the most accurate way to profile, but not always. The second kind of profiler um, that you're going to find is what's called a sampling profiler. What sampling profilers do is they connect to your Python VM and they take a snapshot of what's going on at that moment in time and then they get the hell out of there. And you can fine tune how often they, they take the snapshot to get a more and more accurate picture. 
in theory, if you sample often enough, there's not much difference between this and, a, and a, an instrumenting profiler, although it will be an awful lot slower to run. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of uh, an instrumenting profiler at work and a sampling profiler at work. So I sat down and it turns out to be really hard to write a good code example for illustrating the benefits of profiling. If you want to deliberately write slow code um, that the profiler will see and recognize and illustrate well. So I was very grateful to find uh, this code example on uh, Stack Overflow. It's the sieve of Verastomies. It's going to generate all the primes up to 20,000. Don't worry too much about the sieve itself and the algorithm and how good or bad it is. This is code purely to, uh, to illustrate what happens when we profile it. So to profile it, you've got C profile. C profile is an instrumenting profiler that's built into Python as standard. It's always there. You've already got it. The first line there is how do you run it? Dash MC profile, dash O profile output one. The dash O option is saying this is where you put the output. And then you give it the name of your file. It'll run it, it'll profile it, it'll generate an output file. There's uh, a bunch of tools for analyzing the output of these things. Um, run Snake I like because it's simple and it's easy and you can just pip install it. Uh, KCacheGrind is available in KDE and is an absolute monster of a tool with many, many, many more options. I personally have never actually felt the need to get good with it, but if this is something you're going to invest a lot of time on, I'd recommend taking a look at it. So what you see in Run Snake here is the various different points this code had entered into, and the really useful part is the little grid view over on the right-hand side. Basically, the bigger the box, the more time was spent in it. If one box is inside another, it's included in it. So if you see the, the prime civ.py, that's our main Python uh, file, so obviously enough, almost all of the time is spent in there. But down the bottom we have method remove of list. So this script is spending an insane amount of its time just removing things from lists. That turns out to be, what, looking at that, about a fifth of the total execution time. So if I flip back a slide, is this updating? No, it's just my laptop that's being. Uh, so if you look at that, if f in primes, primes.remove f. That's where the majority of your execution time is. It's modifying a list object. So very helpfully, uh, when I found that code, the guy had always said, oh, that's why it's slow. And he switched to a dictionary-based implementation. Now, when you profile that with a prime sieve one of 200,000, the first version takes 2.3 seconds to run. The second version takes 0.3 seconds to run, which is a nice advantage, but it doesn't seem like that big a deal. Until you realize if you give it an argument of 2 million, that turns into 20 minutes versus 5 seconds. So a switch from a list-based implementation to a dictionary-based uh, implementation makes a pretty huge difference when you actually start to deal with large numbers. And if we look at back to our little screenshot, it's kind of hard to miss. Now, not every profiling example is going to have something that glaring. A lot of the time, you will fire up a tool like this, and you'll get a huge, vast grid of boxes, all roughly the same size, and it won't be obvious at all. But there are times when you file up the profiler, and you go, ah, I shouldn't be using the list. It's that simple. So if you want to see what your code is doing, this would be your first stop. Five minutes running. OK, I should be good. Um, there are two ways to hook C profile straight into Django. I don't really use either of them regularly. This is Django C profile middleware, uh, which is a piece of middleware you can load into Django, which will automatically generate those output files every time you hit it. And there's an alternative to run server called Django dev server, which is much nicer, multi-threaded, and has C profile support built in. Um, really not that big an advantage over the built-in Django toolbar panels. So for the sampling profiler, I've got the same example again, but I've deliberately made it worse. If you look at that prime list up at the top of the screen, I've built this so every time it runs, it adds it, the primes onto a pre-existing list of primes. I've basically built it to leak memory. Every time it runs, it's going to do it again and again and again. So this is the shiny new tool. I cannot stand over this as a production tool because I've only recently discovered it. However, it does look really promising. Um, you can connect to remote servers and remote <coughs> applications, providing you've put a tiny bit of instrumentation in ahead of time, which means it's practical to attach to one of your production servers with this, analyze a bit of the data, and detach without putting a huge overhead on it. Not something I've done in the wild yet. Um, this tool is free for open source projects, but uh, personal, uh, sorry, personal and open source use is free. Commercial use requires a $99 license, which is not breaking the bank. 
But what you can see here in the screenshot is when you fire this tool up, it literally says, if you're firing it at your local box, it'll show you a list of every currently running Python process. You pick the one you want, and it'll give you this kind of a display. Uh, you can also elect to connect to a remote machine, and providing you put the little bit of instrumentation in there, it'll work just fine there as well. So you can see on the graph here, the CPU is pretty much pegged, which is what you'd expect on something computationally intensive like um, the sieve of Erastamies. But the interesting part is the part I deliberately set up. You can see the memory usage, and you can see it slowly climb over time, exactly as you'd expect, because every single time it iterates, it's gobbling a little bit more memory. So, as I said, take this one with a pinch of salt, um, but if you are looking at some way to try and get some profiling data on a production server, this is the path I'm currently pursuing to try and do it. Recommended reading. Um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. This book is absolutely bloody magnificent. Uh, it might not be your particular cup of tea, in which case just read chapter 26. Chapter 26, even though he's talking about motorcycles, is the best description of a good troubleshooting and debugging mindset that I have ever heard. Um, every page of it is little words of wisdom. Um, I had ordered 10 copies of it, which I was going to give away today, and they haven't arrived in time. But there is a little sheet of paper on the Rapid Ratings desk over there. Stick your name and your email down, agree to be contacted by our recruiters, and I'll post you a free copy next week. So if you'd like to read that, uh, you can get a free one just by going over and talking to us.